Good morning, everybody. Happy Mother's Day, moms. Um, for those of you watching online, happy Mother's Day. We're glad you're viewing today. We got um, some special things in store. And, and right now, I, I, I just want to take a moment, really, um, to honor you moms, because my mom had three sons, and um, I mean, most of you know my story. Um, me and my brothers were pretty wild, and I, I don't know how moms do it. I don't know how my wife does it. I don't know how um, any of you moms do it. You moms are amazing, and um, so I would like for you guys to give the moms a hand really quick. From the bottom of my heart, I, I truly cherish you moms and what you mean in the lives of your kids because you truly do um, show them Jesus through your grace with them because I know that sometimes you just want to choke their little necks and you don't. And so you're showing them grace and I, I'm thankful for the way that you, you love your children. Now, um, we found a video that I want to show that I really think is powerful that speaks to who you moms are and what you moms do. So, Vonda, you want to roll that video? There are those who say that this is ordinary, but don't let that fool you. Mother will always be the bravest, least ordinary, most difficult, utterly challenging career that anyone ever hopes to lay claim to. While others might hear, diaper changer, food maker, laundry doer, carpooler, bottle washer, sweatpants wear, life on hold, want to be doing anything else, woman. The truth is, whether it feels like it some days or not, you are in fact a shelter from the storm. You are a cape of good hope. You are a warrior who will do battle for your children's hearts, souls, attention, innocence, education, and memories. Go to battle, my friends. This is your time. We will hold strong on either side of you. We will pray for those bottles through the dark watches of the night. And when doubt comes and children break, when adults fail them, and when they push and push as hard against us as the day we deliver them into this world, we will not be broken. We may ache and see cracks tear through our hearts, but we will get up again tomorrow and we will load the clothes and the words that need to be said again and again and again. And when the world tries to claw at them, to break them, to smash the beauty in them, may our walls hold true. May the lessons we've told, the truths we've lived, the life we've spoken into them come back easily, predictably, with wash and repeat ease. Kingdom business, Jesus work this shaping of souls, this raising tiny humans. There are those that say this is ordinary. Don't buy it for a second. Mighty, you are mighty because you, mother. I think you should give the moms a hand one more time. Woo! 
Moms, did that speak to y'all? I hope it did, because what you're doing is a mighty work. You are building the kingdom through your children. Now, um, we recognize here that, that being a mom is not an easy thing, that it's very stressful. And um, we also know that one of the greatest ways to relieve stress is through a massage. <laughs> so, um, what we have is um, Miss Debbie Robertson has said that um, she will provide to um, one lucky mom each service a massage, and that's why you moms have been getting raffle tickets. Um, she's going to do a massage for somebody to help you out, to ease that burden just a little bit, and um, we're glad that she's able to do this. So um, I would like to have, let's see, how about Mike Hoxie? You just walked in the door. Why don't you come on up, Mike? I need you to come do a drawing. You knew I'd get you up here sooner or later. Make it easy the first time. Just reach in and grab out one ticket. All right. So we have six, four, five, two, nine, two. Regina Taylor. All right, Regina. Here you go. Thank you. That's not the right number. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Guys, um, I I'm glad you're here today, and, and I'm thankful to be able to do something for you, Regina. We wish that we could do it for all of you moms because you all deserve it. Um, so what I will try to do instead is allow God to speak through me today in your lives to give you something that may be useful for you. So whether you're it's your first time here, um, you're, you're coming back, you know, still just kind of checking things out. You, you've been a partner for a significant amount of time. I'm one of the original planners. Whatever you are, I, I pray that today that, um, that God will use this to speak to you because we're looking at today, if you'll recall, one of the questions I get asked so frequently is what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? And last week we began trying to figure that out to help us understand what God's will for our life is. And I, I want to pose a question to everybody right now. If, if you could take a new job, but you would have to move to a new city, let's say you had to move, would you be willing to move to a new city for 12000 extra dollars? Show of hands. We, it's okay to show. Okay, some of you, you, you I, I'm willing to offer more. I want to see. Um, how, how many um, for, for 50000 more? would move to another city uh, for a hundred thousand more who would who would move to another city now then then the question would become though how do you know that's God's will how do you know the money uh, show me the money okay Jerry Maguire <laughs> so how do you really know that that's God's will what, what about completely changing your careers. Maybe some of you have gone to school and you're, you're a professional in a certain area. Would, would you be willing to change your career to do something else um, for a significant amount of money? Would you be willing to do that? But how do you know if that's God's will? Would, would, the, would the money be the thing that determines your decision? And, and that's what I want us to learn today is how to make wise decisions as we seek God's direction. And, and what Chris said praying about it is so true, but there's so much we're going to look at today that's very practical for you. I believe that you're going to get something out of today's message that's going to help you. Now, it's critical to understand in all of this that when you're looking at God's will for your life, what's most important is not the question of what does God want me to do. The most important part is who God wants you to be. It starts with character first, who God wants you to be. God's will for your life is not that you do this or that. God's will is that you are holy. That's, that's what we read last week. So it starts with having the, or being the right who. And then your motives have to be about not what, but why. Why am I doing this? Now, with that foundation, we can really start looking today at what's going on as we look at our wisdom to discern here. And you'll recall last week I talked about one of the reasons that we have hard time nowadays making decisions is because we have so many options 
I mean, so many options. I, I struggle on Netflix. I can never find a movie, and that, that, the struggle is real. I will scroll through and scroll through looking for a movie. Well, that's one reason we have a hard time making decisions today, but another reason we have a hard time making decisions today is because now with social media, we see everybody's highlight reel, their view of perfection, and we have a hard time making decisions because we want to live up to the standards that we see other people posting all their good things. Because nobody really ever posts their bad things. They, they post the best parts of their life so that they look really good. And then we all see that and we have that false view of what's going on in people's lives. And then we go to make a decision and it's like, well, if I do this, it's not going to line up with them. And I've got I've to line up with them. So I don't know what to do here. And we make our decisions based upon a, a false reality. And that makes it hard on us today to make decisions. We struggle with this. And then I think, I think that if we struggle looking at people and what we see in their lives is their perfect lives, what about when we look at God's perfect will? And we want to be perfectly within God's perfect will. And if we struggle making decisions based upon people's perfection, then we have a hard time especially trying to decide, is this God's perfect will for my life? And we kind of get paralyzed in that. Well, God's perfect will for our life um, has a lot of variables, in it, and that's what we're going to see today. You know, I think that some of you think that when you say, Jesus, I'm yours. I surrender my life to you. I, I belong to you, Jesus. I think that sometimes we think that all of a sudden our lives are going to be perfectly perfect, smooth as a river rock, and that God will tell us exactly what to do about every single thing. And that's not true. That's not true. In fact, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul who, who had persecuted Christians and he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and his life is completely transformed. He no longer lives the same. Now he becomes someone that goes out. He's the greatest church planner of all time. He writes two-thirds of the New Testament underneath the power of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul was a guy that, I mean, you would think that if anyone would know all the details and exactly what to do, surely the Apostle Paul knows exactly what to do because God has given him a powerful vision. I mean, he's encountered the risen Lord, so certainly he knows exactly what to do, right? He doesn't. There's a, there's a section here in the book of 1 Corinthians that I love that, that really, it really says a lot about the fact that we're going to have resistance in our faith, we're going to have struggles in our faith, and sometimes we're not going to know exactly what to do because Paul writes 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 6 through 9. First off, he says, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps I will stay with you for a while or even spend the winter. Don't really know yet which way I'm going to go. Perhaps I'll do this. Maybe I'll stay the whole winter. Maybe I'll do this so that you can help me on my journey. What's it say? Wherever I go. Wait a minute, Paul. You don't know where you're going next? I mean, Paul. You, you don't know what city you're going to next? He says, wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. But I hope to spend some time with you. I hope to. That means it's not for sure. God has not laid this out for me perfectly clear that I'm going to be spending the next three months with you. He says, I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me and there are many who oppose me. Paul did not know everything. But Paul very, very, would you, would you not all agree he very, very effectively served the Lord? Paul was very effective in his ministry to the Gentiles, and his ministry still reaches us today because the word that we read, again, two-thirds of it in the New Testament was penned by the hand of Paul. He's still very, very effective today in his ministry, but he didn't know everything. So when you have choices to make, it's not always going to be very, very clear exactly what you should do, but God will give you the wisdom to decide. He'll give you the wisdom to decide, and that's what we need is wisdom. In the Old Testament, we had King Solomon, who was, 
He was the son of King David. And, and King Solomon, he decided that he wanted to do something very extravagant for the Lord to really show how much faith he had, to really let God know, I love you so much. I want to do this thing for you. I want to go over and above for you, God. So he actually sacrificed over a thousand animals for the Lord. I mean, he did this because he loved God and he wanted to say, this is yours. You deserve this because you are worthy. God, I give this to you. And so then in a dream, God came to King Solomon. And he says, because of your faith and because of your great love for me, because of what you've done, I will give you anything you want. Anything. Whatever it is, you tell me what you want. And the king, he didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for um, women. He, he didn't ask for a long, healthful life. What the king asked for was wisdom. Wisdom to lead. Wisdom to make decisions. Wisdom to be able to do things in a godly manner and make choices that would, that would reflect on who he was in God and be able to lead God's people. You know, the decisions that we make today determine the stories that we tell tomorrow. And so we, like him, should ask for wisdom in the decisions that we make so we have incredible stories to tell. You'll remember last week I told you at this point in my life, I'm thinking about things a little bit different than I used to, and it's not about accomplishments anymore. It's about people. It's about relationships. It's the stories like, and I, I love that like after both services last week, after both services, I had so many of you go up or come up to me and tell me, I went up to Nash and I said, what kind of candy did daddy steal from you? And he wouldn't tell me. He, he was a little shy, but I asked him and he still says, gobber stoppers. <laughs> he, he was a little shy when y'all asked him, but I love that y'all tried. That was great. Um, I, I'm thinking about things differently in my life and the relationships. That's that's what's important. That's what Jesus died for was so that we could have a relationship with God. That's, that's what he wants with us, and relationships are important, and we need wisdom to make good decisions that allow us to fulfill the great commandment and the great commission, that allow us to fulfill loving God above all else and loving people as we love ourselves and then making Jesus known. Um, King Solomon, who asked for wisdom, and he had godly wisdom, he wrote in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, he didn't say, getting wisdom was the dumbest thing I could have asked for. I should have asked for more money or more power. I should have asked for these other things. He said, getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And this is coming from the wisest man who's ever lived. A man who had supernatural wisdom that was imparted to him by God. He's telling us getting wisdom is the wisest thing that you can do. And then he says, and whatever else you do, develop good judgment. Develop Good judgment. How many of you have ever said, if I only knew then what I know now? You know what's happened? The reason you're saying that is because somewhere you developed some wisdom about something. And you're going, oh, if I'd only known then, I would have changed it so it would be a different now. Well, that's what I want you to learn today is how to have wisdom so that you can one day have stories to tell that you're not going, if I'd only known then. I want to help you today discover through God's word how to make the choice now that will give you a better then, okay? So the first thing we got to know if we're looking at um, directional wisdom, we're talking about divine direction, if we're looking at directional wisdom, the first thing I want you to write down is walk. Walk. And some of you, this may seem a little bit familiar, but I cannot preach this enough because we have new people for this particular point. We have new people that need to hear this constantly. In fact, we all need this reminder because it's so easy to mess up in this. But listen, guys, if you want wisdom, the Bible tells us walk with the wise and what? Everybody, the Bible tells us walk with the wise and what? So if you want wisdom, what would be one of your first steps? To walk with the wise. Walk with the wise and you will become wise. For a companion of fools suffers much harm. A companion of fools suffers much harm. If you ever see three guys in a single cab pickup and there's a cooler in the back, you know it's not going to turn out well, right? 
That's just the way that goes. A companion of fools suffers much harm. Now, we don't want to suffer harm. We want lives that, that are full of God's favor upon us. So what we need to do is surround ourselves. Skip, you've been hanging out with John and, and, and Nate doing a little run, and Nate told me, he said, man, Skipper tried to kill me, and I just want to... I just want to commend you for, for walking with the wise. That's, that's, what, that's what you have to do. You have to walk with the wise. It, listen, if, if you're trying to stop doing drugs, okay, if you're trying to stop doing drugs, and all your friends that you hang out with are doing drugs, do you think that you're going to be very successful in your endeavor to stop doing drugs? Probably not going to happen for you. Um, if you are, if you're, always overspending, trying to keep up with the Joneses. You're spending way too much money because we don't have a lot. Stop overspending. Hang out with people that don't try to live life lavishly. If you can't afford to be a jet setter, then don't hang out with jet setters because they're going to run your credit down into the ground and you're going to have debt that is over your head. Hang out with people that understand how to manage money, that they're, they're only sla they're, the only debt they have is a continuing debt to love one another, and they're not overspending. Don't, don't hang out with people like that. If you're wanting to, to live a godly life, who all in here wants to live a godly life? That's pretty good. I'm, I'm glad that every hand is up for that because that's important. If, if you want to live a godly life, how, how many of your friends, how many of your friends are doing the same thing? Because if your friends aren't living godly lives, they're only going to tear you down. If, if you want to live a godly life, you have to surround yourself around people that live godly lives. That's why I cannot, 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 cannot stress enough to you the importance of life groups. Life groups are a change agent in people's lives because they surround themselves with people that are trying to live godly lives and not trying to continue on in the junk that they were in. If you want to be a part of people, a, if you want a fellowship, a community of people that are really doing life differently, you have to get involved in a life group. You need to be in a life group. Um, students, youth, and not just on Wednesday nights. Students, you need to be hanging out with teenagers that are chasing God all the time. If you want to maximize who you are in Christ, if you want to fulfill the potential that he has on your life, oh, I'm looking right at you, son. If, he, if you want that in your life, you've got to hang out with people that are doing the same thing. You have to do that. Um, for me, um, what I knew that I wanted for sure when I... When I got home from prison, when I got home, what I knew for sure that I wanted, um, one was, was to be a godly man. I, I knew that I wanted to be godly. I knew that I wanted to be a good husband. And I knew that I wanted to be a good father. And a lot of my friends that I'd had, um, they were not a reflection of any one of those three. Um, I was hanging out with the wild and the broken and the broke, <laughs> um, the broke, you know, and, and, and I, knew that, I knew that I didn't want that. I knew I needed a new sphere of influence in my life. I knew that I wanted um, to reach my potential in Christ. Now, I thought that what that meant for me was going to be an engineer. You know, I denied my calling. I, I, I did not feel like I could be who God created me to be anymore because I'd messed that up. So I wanted to be an engineer, but I still wanted to be a godly man because I loved the Lord. So um, I started walking with the right people. I asked Pastor Scott Harness to mentor me. I said, Pastor Scott, if you'll just give me one day, just one day of your life, just one day. I said, and I'm not so dumb to think that you can actually give me one day right now. So Pastor, if you'll just give me, if you'll just give me one day hour, one hour a week for 24 weeks. I believe that God can use that to change my life. And so we started meeting, and I got him addicted to Reuben sandwiches at Jason's Deli. 
Um, <laughs> and he poured into me. And Pastor Scott, to me, is the greatest spiritual leader and the greatest spiritual communicator I've ever met in my life. I've, I've seen some world-class speakers. I've met some world-class speakers. Um, I, I, I watch a lot of stuff online. I try to learn. But Pastor Scott, maybe because when I was desperately hurting, he came up to me and he held me tight. Maybe, maybe, I, I, maybe I have a special place in my heart for him, but the way that he communicates and the way that he invested in me changed my life. So he was helping with that spiritual side of it. Um, with the, with the being a good father and being a good husband side, that, that was a twofold person. It was one guy that did both things, and that was my good friend Cliff Holland, who some of you have met. Um, he's a missionary with Family Life, and, and he focuses on men, families, and husbands, and how that they can be all God wants them to be, how they can first and foremost be a godly man, secondly, be a godly husband, and third, be a godly father. And, and I hung out with these people so that they could invest in me and help me accomplish what I wanted to do. If, if I wanted to be a godly man, if, if I wanted to be a, a good husband and a good father, if I'm hanging out with people that aren't doing well at this, what am I going to learn? I'm going to be just like those people that aren't doing well, so I needed people in my life that would invest in me. So that's why I surrounded myself with these people. And you'll notice in that verse, it doesn't say have a one-time meeting with the wise. Don't think that you can schedule an appointment or something to come see me and all of a sudden you'll be wise. It says walk with the wise. That means constantly doing life with them. You, you walk with them. It's a perpetual, continual thing. I can call Scott right now and he won't answer because he's preaching. But after service, I can, and he'll answer. I can call Cliff right now, and Cliff would probably answer in the middle of service because he doesn't preach, and he'd probably go, oh, my God, Derek's supposed to be preaching, and he's calling me, and he would answer. They're still a part of my life today. I don't see Cliff as much as I would like, but now I have other godly people in my life. I have Pastor Joe. I have Pastor Nathan. I have Pastor Tyler. I have Sean. I have Brent Lewitt. I have people in my life that are godly, that I surround myself with, that I walk with. I have my brother Mike rising up. So many, and, and guys, I'm not just picking people. There's so many of you in this room. Matt is around. And Bill, Bill, by the way, Bill, I'm really proud of you, man. I don't know if I've ever said that from up here. But my gosh, dude, what God has been doing in your life is incredible. And you keep on keeping on. You don't stop. You keep it up. And you keep surrounding yourself with the people that you have been. And God is going to do incredible things for you. You keep it up, okay? Guys, it's impossible to live the right life with the wrong friends. If you want to make good decisions and you want to become wise, you've got to walk with the wise. That's a fact. There's no argument there. The Bible says... Walk with the wise and become wise, but a companion of fools suffers much harm. Do you want harm or do you want to be wise and seek God's very best for your life? You've got a decision to make now. God's not going to tell you exactly what decision to make. It already says it in his word. You've got to make that decision yourself. I pray that you will have the wisdom to do it. And to get the wisdom to make that decision, the next thing you've got to do, write this down, is ask. Ask. Just, just ask. James chapter 1, verse 5, James was Jesus' brother. He was a great pastor. And James said, if any of you lacks wisdom, what, what's it say? If you lack wisdom, ask God. That's pretty black and white there. If you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you will be given to you. You know, um, I have five kids, six including Logan, but he's at home with the Lord. Um, I have five, and right now at this point, I know more than all of them because of my cumulative experience, my, my education. Um, but what I've experienced with my kids, it's really weird. It's really, really weird. Like my two-year-old, Nash, I'm like his hero, man. And he believes everything I say. I could tell him. I could tell him, man, I just got home from the moon last night. And he'd want a moon rock, you know. He'd think I was really there. 
When, when they're young, they listen to everything you say. But then as they get a little bit older, they start thinking they know what's best and they know more than dad. I think that we do that with God. You know, when we were young, that's not that childlike faith for such as these is the kingdom of heaven. When we were young, we believed everything he said. But then we got a little bit older, we'd experienced a few things, and now all of a sudden it's like we know more than him. Are you kidding me? We know more than God, but we live that way. We live like we know what's best instead of listening to what he tells us is best, instead of just doing what he says. We live like we know what's best. We're like a bunch of teenagers. Think about that, parents. Moms on Mother's Day, think about that. That's how we are to God. We're like a bunch of teenagers. Sometimes I bet he just wants to wring our necks. Thank God for his grace and for what Jesus Christ did for us. Thank God for his love. Anyways, so my kids are growing up. And, and, and I want to let them make more and more decisions. And I have a commitment that when my kids move out of the house, not while they're in the house, while they're in the house, I'm going to tell them what to do. But when they move out of the house, I want to be, um, how can I phrase this? I want to be a low-maintenance parent. Because, you know, I think some of you may have some high-maintenance in-laws. And nobody wants that, all right, trying to tell you everything to do. I want to be a very low-maintenance parent. I want, I want to let my adult children, I want to let them make decisions. And I'm not really going to try to be all up in their grill telling them what they're doing wrong. I'm going to let them live. I'm, I'm not going to be all over them. They're, they're going to live and they're going to learn. They're going to make some mistakes along the way. They're going to have some things that they're going to say, if I'd only known then what I know now. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you, the moment one of my adult children asks me, Dad, what should I do? I'm going to open up and pour out the rain upon them on this is what you should do. I don't know why you're even doing this. I'm going to tell them everything because I want the very, very best for their lives. I'm going to let them make some bad choices. But I want the best for their lives. So I'm going to give them everything I have to get them back on the right track, to guide them on the right path. Are you starting to see the connection here? God lets us make choices. But as our father, just like I want to be with my kids, as our father, he wants us to say, God, what should I do here? God, which way should I go? God, I need wisdom to make a decision. I know you might not show me left or right, but give me wisdom to make the best choice in this situation. And he's going to give us everything that we need to make the best choice possible. Does that make sense to you today? Are you hearing this? Because that's how I'm going to be with them. And I believe that with a father's heart that, that I have somewhat of the father's heart. And that when I ask him, when you ask him, when we ask him, God, give us wisdom to make the best choice here that he's going to give us that wisdom. He even says so. He gives generously, and if we ask, it will be given to us. You know, in Psalm 32, 8, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will guide you. I will guide you. What's a guide do? They, they show you the way. But you have to make a choice. You have to decide to follow that way or not. You can get off in the wilderness and get bitten by a rattling copper moccasin. Or you can just... I should let that set in for a second. <laughs> think I was moving too fast there. A rattling copper moccasin. Yeah, you got to watch out for those. That's those one-step droppers right there. He says, I will guide you along the... What's it say? The best path. I will guide you along the best path for your life. I will advise you. And I will watch over you. It makes me think of um, when your kids are learning to ride a bike. Any one of your kids. <laughs> the kind you pedal, your little kids. 
on a pedal bike. When, when, when your kids are learning to ride a bike, dads, even moms, how many of you ran alongside them, dying, <laughs> trying to, but you weren't going to let them fall? You weren't going to let them get off the road? If they started to, what would you do? Snatch them up in your arms, you know? You're not going to let them hit the ground. I, I, think, I think that that's really what God wants to do for us, but we don't let him. We tell him, no, nah, you know what, I'm just going to go my own way. And then we end up falling off the bike instead of just going where we need to go and letting him stay in step with us. In fact, letting us stay in step with him. That's, that's our problem. We've we, we got to go along the path that he's saying. He wants to give us the best, best path for our lives. Do you want the best path for your life? Why ain't like everyone going, yeah, who, who, okay, who wants the worst path for your life? That's what I thought. Nobody's shaking your head yes now. Who wants the best path for your life? Then you've got to seek God, all right? You've got to walk with the wise. You've got to ask him. And then what you have to learn to do is decide. 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 Man, I, I like the old Karate Kid movie. I've probably, I've probably taught like 15 Miyagi verses over the course of Sold Out Church, man. And they're not biblical, but Miyagi is wise, okay? And, and y'all remember, and, and I'm not talking about, the, listen, I'm not talking about the new one. The, the new one's a good movie. I'm talking about the old one with, with the old Mr. Miyagi, Danielson, Danielson. Miyagi told Danielson, he said, Danielson, must talk. Walk on road. Walk right side, safe. Walk left side, safe. Walk middle, Sooner or later, get squashed, just like grape. You remember that? Get squashed, just like grape. You can't just walk down the middle. You you got to get on the left, or you got to make a decision. You have to decide. You must decide. You must decide, and don't be afraid to make a mistake. Just make the choice, man. Make the call. Go ahead and pick that Netflix movie. It may be the dumbest thing you ever watched, and you might not be able to get those two hours back. But you know what? You'll know what not to do again. You won't watch that one again. Don't be afraid of making the mistake. Ask God for the wisdom to help you make the decision and then decide. Make the choice. Just do it. Just do it. It it may, I mean, it's possible. It's possible. It could result in an extra bill in the mail. It's possible. It could. Your decision could be a bad one, and, and you could end up because you don't listen to what God says. You, you could end up doing an extra semester in school. You might end up with an extra kid. Who knows, okay? But, but you've got to ask him for the wisdom to make the decision, and then you have to decide. You must decide. You must decide. So, so how do you know? Which way should you go? How do I know if it's God? Is this God speaking to me? Is this me speaking to me? Is this my thought? Is this the devil speaking to me? Is this the devil trying to get me to do the opposite of what God wants? Is this God trying to lead me out of what the devil's trying to get me to do? I don't know what to do here. How do I decide? Here's how you decide. Most practical thing you're ever going to hear. Where scripture, where scripture lays it out, do what the Bible tells you, period. Where scripture lays it out. If there is some sort of moral directive from the Bible that tells you what to do, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Where the word is clear, obey. If, if you meet someone, and man, they seem perfect for you. The problem is, maybe you're already married. But you look at the other side, and you're like, oh man, the grass is greener on the other side. Scripture's pretty clear on this. Water your own grass. God hates divorce. Period. <laughs> if if you could move to another city and you could get rich, going back to the original question, you can get rich by doing it, but you'll never see your family. You can't lead your home. You'll neglect your wife because you'll never be around her. What does scripture say about that? Lo- husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and willing to lay down your life for her and manage your family well. That's what scripture says. So what should we do? Stay. Stay. If, if, if you're questioning your own sexuality, what does scripture say about that? 
honor God with your bodies. So just do what the Bible says. If you have a question and it's written in black and white, just do what it says. Otherwise, if, if it's not written there, if it's one of those things like Burger King or McDonald's, which way should I go? That's, that's tough because they're both nasty. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go Taco Bell. I'm going to go completely outside because you all know it's outside the box, all right? Um, <laughs> where there is no moral command, God will give you the wisdom to choose, and this is what he says. He says, I love you, and I trust you. Now decide. I love you, and I trust you. Now decide. When Paul was trying to decide... Um, he didn't get this revelation from God that said, the Lord spoketh to me. And the Lord saith, waiteth, writeth here. That's not what he said. He says in the book to the church, written, uh, written to the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, so when we could stand it no longer, what's it say? We thought it best. We thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. When we could stand it no longer, we thought it best. We just did what we thought best. And when you're making your decisions, that's what you have to do. Ask God for the wisdom to help you decide and then do what you think is best. Tying it all together now. I wanted to be an engineer. And I had a really good plan because I, I've worked as a um, project manager's assistant. Todd, can I get an amen when I say that people on the job site hate engineers? John, amen. Mike, amen. Hate them. Why? Because what works on paper don't always work in the real world. So I had a very good strategy. Planned it out. Knew what I was going to do. My little brother is a journeyman electrician. And he got me accepted into the union. And what I was going to do was going to go out in the field and be an electrician. And do that for a couple years. And then I would begin T finishing an, an engineering degree. And so then, man, I'd have gotten rich because I'd have been a top demand engineer because I would have known what actually works that doesn't on paper because I've been there and I've experienced it, you know? And that was my plan. That's what I was going to do. I was going to make a lot of money. We lost Logan. And me and God wrestled. And I was like, why, God? And all God would really remind me is, Son, I'm in control. I'm your child. Trust me on this. And through that, I realize God knows what's best because he's a good, good father. And then I got to thinking, if God had called me to be a pastor when I was eight and I went astray, so far astray that now I'm afraid people will never listen to me, but God said, well, who do I think I am to disobey, to ignore him? Why am I questioning what God said? That's Satan's trick. Did God really say? And that's what I was doing. Did God really say I should be a pastor? Well, it's not written in the Bible. I can't turn to the book of James and it says, Derek, thou shalt be a pastor. That was God's voice speaking to me. And so I wrestled with that. And I made a decision. After talking to people, I watched this. I talked to some people who weren't necessarily wise. They weren't necessarily walking with the Lord. And they were like, are you crazy? Don't be an idiot. Don't, don't give up what you're doing. You just got accepted into this program. Man, you're going to fulfill your dream. Don't be a moron. Don't do that. That's what those that weren't wise said. So I had to talk to those that were wise. Talk to Pastor Scott. Pastor Scott said, Derek, you just keep on serving. You just keep on doing the next right thing and God will open the door. He said, but. That, was, that didn't help me a lot right there, right? That didn't really help me, but that's what he said. And then he goes, but if you can do anything else with your life, other than being in ministry, if there's anything else in your life that you can do and you think that you can please God, then I'm telling you, do it. Do it, because this thing is tough. That's what he told me. 
Not thinking about it. Keep serving and God will open the door. Been serving. God has opened this door. I know what door I have to walk with. So I, I talked to Cliff. I said, Cliff, what should I do here, man? He said, Eric Jones, are you kidding me? This is what you were made for. This is what you were made for. Now, the Bible didn't say it, but I had to make a decision. I decided. The rest is history. Gave up a lot of money. Gave up even more money when I became a full-time pastor. But the rest is history, and it's not just history. The rest is eternal. Because there's 400 lights that represent souls that have, been, have given their lives to Jesus Christ through a wise decision that I made with godly counsel. And here's a room full of people right now that are receiving the word of God that can take it and apply it in their lives. And so the decision I made, while the rest is history, the story I get to tell echoes in eternity. And in eternity, I can get to say, I'm glad I listened to what God's word said. And I'm glad I trusted him in my life. And I'm glad that I did what he wanted me to do. Because now I get to know and love all of you. So, so nowadays, I still have to do the same thing. I still have decisions to make every day. Leadership decisions, parental decisions, um, spousal decisions, um, motorcycle ministry decisions. There's decisions to be made every day. So what do I do? Well, I surround myself with people that have helped me become wise. Still around them. I ask for wisdom in the decision. I ask for counsel. Ashley, how many times a week do I say, Ashley, what do you think about this? What, what, do, you, what, tell, what do you think? Bounce things off of Amy. Call up Joe. Joe, look, what do you think, man? What do you, what do you think right now? But at the end of the day, I've got to make a decision. And that's what you have to do in your lives. Keep on every day. Walking with the wise, asking God for wisdom, and then you must decide. And remember through all of it, remember through all of it, that God said he will guide you along the best pathway for your life. Best pathway for your life. So ask, walk, ask, and decide. And let him guide you through wise decisions along the best pathway for your life. I have no doubt, I have no doubt that this is the best pathway for my life. I thank God that he gave me the wisdom, the courage to make the right decisions. Um, so in your decisions, I pray that you'll do the same thing. Will you, will you bow your heads and close your eyes for me? If today, hearing this, and you have decisions to make, and, and maybe you've been struggling with them, you, you don't know what to do, you're, you're, you're trying to figure it out, and you don't, you don't know which way to go, but today, through, through the truth of God's word and the power of his living word, even the Holy Spirit speaking within you, if, if, if you're hearing this today and you're committed now to doing exactly this, you're, you're going to surround yourself with the wise because you don't want to suffer harm. You, you, you're you're going to surround yourself with the wise because you want to be wise. You want to make wise decisions, and, and you're committed to asking God for wisdom in your decisions because you love him and you know he loves you and he only wants the best pathway for your life. And you want him right now to give you the courage to where if, you, if the Bible does not lay it out completely clearly, you want him to give you the courage to decide anyways, not to be afraid to make a mistake, but decide with wisdom and allow God to lead you along the best pathway of your life. If that's you today, can I see your hands so I can pray with you right now? Praise God. I'm seeing hands all over the room. Thank you, God. I want to pray with you guys. God, thank you for the people that are committed to this because, Lord, it's not a, it's not a three-step fix, but it's, it's three steps in our lifetime journey of seeking and becoming more like you. It's three things that we can do to help us make the very best decisions so that we can go in the direction that you would have us go in our lives. So, God, we, we do commit to walking with the wise, surrounding ourselves with godly people that can help us reach our potential in you. Where we know for some that's ministry, we know for some that it's banking, we know for some that it's law enforcement, we know for some that it's in the military, we know for some it's in health care. God, we know 
that there are so many different places that are the best pathway for our lives. But in it all, we want to seek you and we want to be who you want us to be on that path. And God, when we have decisions to make, give us wisdom. Pour out wisdom upon us. Lord, give us wisdom to make the best decision to stay on that path. And Lord, when it comes time, just give us the courage to decide and not to be afraid. And if we make mistakes, we know, we know that if we make mistakes, you will be there to catch us and help us get back on the right path for our lives. So we trust you and we thank you. And God, we praise you because you are worthy in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, it's hot. Y'all know we need to get those ACs fixed. We got two units out if anybody's wondering why it's hot in here today. We have two units out. And units ain't free. So we're, we're working on it. It's going to happen. We're working on it. Keep coming back. Jesus suffered a cross. You can suffer a little humidity, all right? Um, some of you, though, right now, I want to talk to you really quick about the best decision you can ever make. Some of you today have heard this message. You've heard what's been being said. You've heard me talk about Jesus. You've heard us singing out to Jesus. you heard all of these things. But some of you today don't know who Jesus is. And I want to tell you right now who Jesus is. And, and if, if you want God's very best for your life, it's, it's to say yes to this decision right here. And that decision is this. Jesus Christ came from God. He is both God and man, born of the virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. He never sinned. He never made mistakes. He never had to say, if I'd only knew then what I knew now. He never messed up, not even once. He never stumbled. He never faltered because he did not have within him the sin nature that all of us have. All of us have a propensity to sin. That sounds really fancy. What does that mean? That means all of us tend to disobey. And that's what sin is. It's disobedience to God. And we all have a tendency to do that. Every one of us has disobeyed God in one way or another. And that separates us from God. So God himself made it right when he lived a sinless life and he paid the penalty for sin. He died the death that we all deserve. But that's, that's not where it ends. See, he died the death and then to show the power over death, to show the power of resurrection, the power of life, the power of a new life in him and one day a new eternal life forever in him. He rose from the grave on the third day. He ministered to his disciples. He taught them. He was seen by over 500 people. And then he ascended into heaven. And today he rules as Lord, as King in heaven. And he has some things he wants to give you, but you've got to decide. He wants you to have forgiveness of your sin. He wants you to have the power of the Holy Spirit within you to lead you and guide you. He wants you to have a relationship with him. And he wants you to have eternal life forever with him. And it's a free gift. You don't have to do anything except to decide. You have to decide that I receive that. Now, if he's ruling as Lord, when you say, I decide to accept that, that means you put him in charge. If he's Lord, he's in charge. But he wants you to have that today. So when nobody looking around, if everybody will bow your heads and close your eyes, if there's anybody here that has never surrendered their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and right now you want to accept that gift, you want to make the best decision you ever could have made, if today you want to decide that Jesus is your Lord and to ask forgiveness of your sin, if that is you, then right now let me see your hand. Praise God, I see your hand back here. I see hand. I'm looking around the room. I see your hand as well. Praise God. Brother, look at me. You need to know because of your commitment right now, not because of anything else you ever do, but because of what Jesus did and the fact that you believe that you are forgiven of your sins. You are forgiven, but now you've got to live for him. So I want you to pray this prayer of commitment. And church, we can all pray this with us as well. If you'll just pray right now, Lord Jesus, I've messed up but I believe that you came and gave your life to forgive me of my mistakes. So Lord, I surrender my life to you. I believe your death is enough. And Lord, I celebrate that you've been resurrected 
And that even right now, you're resurrecting me with you. I'm a new creation. Now fill me with your spirit to do your work until you call me home into an eternal life with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God, man. We, um, we're having a baptism today after second service, immediately following second service. And um, we already have five people getting baptized. If you want to get baptized, yeah, y'all should clap. And if, if you want to be added to that, you have time to go change. But after service, just walk out the door, go in the connections room, talk to them about the next steps. Um, for everybody else, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. And while they're coming up, um, you heard me. I mean, I'm sweating up here. It's hot. You're hot. Um, we, we do. We, we, we have to get some AC units. But that's not why we're doing this, guys. We're not doing this to get AC units. When we return our tithes and offerings, it's an act of obedience to God. We are doing what he has commanded us to do. And he says that we'll experience favor because of this. We'll be blessed because of this. And I need you to know today, if, if you're new today and you're going, man, I knew churches were about money. We're not about money. That's not at all what this is about. This is about giving to God what is his, and he uses it through the church to unleash us to do all the ministry that we do in this community. DHS has even recognized us as the church that's doing the most work in this community, making a difference in people's lives. And that is incredible. And it's because of our partnerships and what we do to make Jesus known. And we do it with God's money. It's not the church's money. It's God's money. So it takes all of us giving back to him what belongs to him so that it can be used for ministry and to get AC units, which is a pretty good ministry for us right now. Amen. It's Arkansas and hot. Um, so I'm going to pray over our tithes and offerings, and um, we will be done. Lord, we thank you so much. I thank you. Whether they do or not, I thank you that I get to give back to you. It's a privilege that I get to do this. God, I'm, I'm so blessed because of you and your love for me. And God, I just want to honor you in everything. And your word is very clear on this. This isn't a, trying to make a wise decision where I don't know. Your word is very clear on what to do here. So I present back to you my very first, my very best. And God, I pray that you will bless the rest and that you'll also bless and multiply this to make the biggest difference for your name's sake, to bring you glory, and to build your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, just a couple of announcements before we go. Um, like Derek said earlier, um, we have a baptism right after second service. So if you've not signed up and you want to be baptized, like that is still an option. You just have to go out there and let us know and he'll have a little talk with you. Um, but we also want to go out there and support all of our, our family that's going to be baptized today. So um, please try to make that. And then if you look in your worship guide, there's several other announcements. But like we have a 301 class coming up. Holy Rock Street Revival is coming up. And then Tony's ordination. So make sure you look at those dates and put them in your calendar. Um, we're just going to go ahead and pray over our week. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, and um, I just thank you again for this message, Father. I just I just pray that you would help me put it, put it into practice. Um, walking with the wise, we all need help with that, Father. We all just need to surround ourselves with good people. And so I just ask that you would help us all um, do that. And so I just ask all this in your precious son's name. Amen. Y'all have a good week.